Blog Talk Radio. joining us again today. This is the first show of the new year. How exciting. The first time uh, in the year of 2013 that we are speaking together. <clears throat> and uh, I encourage you, in, uh, if you're listening live, to call in to us at 602-753-1860 as a way of my welcoming you to the new year. Uh, we are on location in Fort Lauderdale, Florida today, and we're using some equipment that isn't our own, and if you hear some static on the line, I'm sorry about that up front, but that's just because I have uh, no way to control that on <laughs> Fortunately, uh, but it is the case, and uh, we should have our guest on the line anytime soon, Dr. George Love, who is a longtime colleague of mine in the world of Chinese medicine, energetics, and acupuncture, and uh, we've been spending a little time out here in uh, the South Florida area for the last week, and I wanted very much to introduce him to all of you to learn about the nature of uh, energy medicine. I know you've heard me talk about it many, many times, and I will continue to talk about it many, many times for good reason. However, um, just to say that um, he hasn't called in yet. I know he's quite busy, and he will be calling in at his very earliest. And uh, when he does, he will be with us. And until that happens, we will be speaking among ourselves, so to speak, and taking a look at what we would like to bring to pass in this new year and to come to an understanding, a greater understanding of who we are as influencers, who we are as people, and the role of love in our daily lives with ourselves and in our relationship to each other. I mean, if you really want to talk about healing, you can't really talk about healing without bringing in the element of love. Love is that motive force behind all things, and there's nothing that makes any of us feel better than when we feel acknowledged and loved. Because when we feel these two things, we feel empowered. And when we feel empowered, in fact, if we were to take a physiological measure of ourselves, we would see that our blood was flowing more smoothly. We would see that our cells were both absorbing nutrients and detoxifying nutrients all the better. So with these uh kinds of literal physiological reactions that are improving our physical body, why wouldn't you want to continue to do those activities that continue to promote that kind of well-being? So that is just one of the many benefits of love. And if you want to talk about healing, at the end of the day, 
when our immune systems are working at their higher level, when our met- metabolic rate is smooth and efficient, when we're burning energy well and prudently, and it's working like the body is working like a well-oiled machine, you know that you're doing something right. That also leaves a huge amount of energy for um, use with other things, what we refer to as leisure time, of intellectual pursuits, of passionate pursuits, of the arts, of sports, of charity, of philanthropy, of making a difference in the world, of creating a better society, of inventing sustainable technologies. I mean, then you are at leisure to do the things you want to do because everything is running so well. So what is this a result of? This is a result, my friends, as I'm suggesting, of love, lots of love. And how do we go about that? Well, we have to start with ourselves. We have to start with our love of self. If you really think about it, all things come from the way we think, the way we hold reality in our minds, in our perceptions, and in our hearts. When we hold things dear to ourselves, then we have a chance to open up the space. But for the moment, I'm going to check in to the – it sounds staticky to me. I have no one – to give me that feedback, ironic as that may sound, unless a guest were to call in or a listener would. To the number of 602-753-1860. And in the meantime, I'm going to just play a little Mozart for you all while I seek to address the technical glitch. having a couple of little bumps along the path today, uh, which is not a reflection of the way the rest of the year is going to be, by the way. (laughs) No, but to overcome the bumps, the resistance, the uh, obstacles in the path, this is a model because those obstacles will be overcome. We will overcome the way Lao Tzu talks about overcoming obstacles which is the old Taoist principle of the soft overcoming the hard. Have you ever thought about water wearing down rock? Yeah, yeah. Water will, over time, wear down rock. So you tell me which is the more powerful, the soft or the hard. So when you look at the very fundamental principles of Chinese thinking, philosophy, and medicine, you will see that is the soft that's overcoming the hard. That's absolutely the foundation of the Chinese martial art, Taiji Chuan, and the Japanese Aikido. The soft overcomes the hard. And our guest is just joining me on the line, Dr. George Love. Are you there? I'm right here, my brother. I am so happy, George, to have you on the line on a Better World Radio. How are you? I am wonderful. 
I'm in a uh, recording studio uh, laying down the music for my next Qigong dance studio. Oh, that's interesting. Interesting. Well, I want to introduce you first. I gave a little bit of an introduction. I want to be a, a little bit more thorough because you deserve... Well, actually, I'll tell you the truth. The audience deserves to know something more of the breadth and the depth, Dr. Love, of your beautiful work over the course of 30-plus years. As I was telling you all, uh, Dr. George Love and I actually know each other for all of these years, having studied Chinese medicine, acupuncture, and some Qigong together. George, you brought a Qigong teacher to uh, our school, and um, that's when I started studying it, quite honestly. I had been a student of Tai Chi before that, but not Qigong. So I owe you a debt of thanks for having done that. George Love has been teaching uh, Chinese medicine, Qigong, breathing, meditation, any number of different medical Qigong-based exercises in his practice down here in South Florida, out of Boca, and actually all over South Florida. He's going to be educating us today about the nature of his work and what you can all do yourselves in your own backyard, that is in your own bedroom or living room, to increase the flow of chi so you can be more radiant and healthier just based on your own knowledge. So, George, my dear brother, I'm so glad to have you on today. Okay, so let me uh, dispel a few myths and clear up a few uh, uh, issues that people have with Chinese medicine. Exactly. In China, Again, clean it up okay. and then lay out, if you would, some practical things that we could do, that people can do on their own I will. even before they come to see a practitioner. Okay. Number one, Chinese medicine in China is called the science of longevity. So picture Western medicine. Do you call that the science of longevity, or do you call it the science of drugs and surgery? Uh, number two, you can go uh, 40 days without food. You can go 14 days without water, but you could only go four minutes without air. So the single most important thing you can do is breathe. Western medicine does not address breathing. Now, it's the only way to purify the blood. So if you don't breathe properly, then you have sludge in your blood, and a lot of people over are very familiar with a drug called Coumadin, which is for sludge in your blood. And there is no test that determines when you should take Coumadin. There is no test that when you can stop taking Coumadin. There is no test that measures the amount of Coumadin. So it's kind of arbitrary per your physician. So if you want to avoid Coumadin, which would affect your sex drive, by the way, you would want to learn how to breathe. Now, if you take more than eight breaths per minute, by Qigong standards, you are unhealthy. So we practice breathing five breaths per minute, four breaths per minute. So if you practice breathing four breaths per minute when you're not concentrating, it'll slow your regular breathing down. Now, water. Everybody says, oh, you need eight glasses of water, six glasses of water. Oh, but I drink orange juice and soy milk and tea. Doesn't that count? Well, I say, do you wash your dishes with tea? Would you mop your floors with orange juice? No, you have to drink water. Now, does water benefit your kidneys? Well, it's not that water benefits the kidneys is that the purpose of drinking water is to dilute the toxins of the food that you're eating so that your kidneys can excrete it. So there is no um, one size fits all on how much water you need to drink. So if you eat a water-based diet, meaning more fruits and vegetables or 60 to 80 percent raw like I do, then you have less concentrated foods and therefore you need less water, but you still have to drink water. So when should you drink your water? 40 ounces in the morning. Well, why, why 40 ounces in the morning? Because the night before, your body's repair mechanism has been cleaning up the body. So the 40 ounces sort of kind of rinses the leaves off the sidewalk, so to speak. Okay? 
Now, the other misunderstanding is what is yin and what is yang? Well, actually, they have no meaning, except in relationship to a specific topic, such as the yin and yang of a table, or the yin and yang of a hill, or the yin and yang of a particular person. So the upper half of the body would be yang, the lower half would be yin. So is the yin and yang in proportion? That's what we want to know. Is the front and the back in proportion? Is the left and right in proportion? So there should be a relative amount of yin to yang. Now, we've all seen the yin-yang symbol, but nobody knows what it really means. The circle implies revolution. So the circle is turning. Number two, within the greatest part of yang, there's a little dot of yin. And within the greatest part of yin, there's a little dot of yang, which means there are no absolutes in nature. Nature naturally transformed from yang to yin. So I heard you say that the yang overcomes or the the, the, no, the hard I said overcomes the, the soft. The soft overcomes the hard. Water okay. overcomes the rock. Okay. So we want to say transforms rather than overcomes. Yes. Okay. So if you jump out of an airplane 100 feet above the water or you jump off a bridge, that water is going to feel like brick. And by the same token, a drop of water on a brick for a year is going to wear the brick away. So yin transforms yang, yang transforms yin. So we want to learn how to be in harmony with our own yin and yang. And the best way to do that is with nature. Now, in the wintertime in New York, it is cold. It is a time to conserve your energy or your chi. It's a time to bundle up and be warm. But what do we do in New York, Mitchell, in the winter? We have our coats open. We're going to Christmas parties. We're drinking. We're running out of hot buildings into the cold we're air. We're drinking hot tea, George, hot tea. Yeah, yeah, hot yeah, hot rum, right. So we're dissipating our energy instead of conserving our energy. And those who disobey the laws of winter will suffer a disease in the spring. And that's why people get yin cold, uh, spring colds. So we're out of how, we're we're out of balance. We're out of harmony with nature. We don't do the things that are necessary to support the circulation of energy. We don't cultivate our chi, and that is why I have focused the last twelve years of my life on chi gong, on teaching chi gong, and certifying instructors in chi gong. So, so, if you would, go go and describe what it means then to cultivate chi, and also then define, if you would, qi kung. Okay. So, chi is literally translated as breath. This way we'll start at the breath. beginning, everybody. Yeah. Okay. So, chi is breath. We call it electromagnetic energy that flows through the body like blood flows through the veins. But this yeah. breath is what you take before you push something heavy or pick up something heavy, okay? If you're pushing a heavy door or you're carrying a heavy suitcase up the steps, you take a deep breath, and then you lift the suitcase. That's using your chi. Mm -hmm. But what if you've depleted your chi? What if you're short of breath? What if you lost a night's sleep? What if you haven't been eating right? What if you haven't been resting well? What if you have emotional stress? Then your chi will be depleted and you won't have any in your reservoir when you absolutely positively have to have it. So the way we cultivate our chi is through meditation and through breathing exercises and through resting and through doing yin exercises. So we hug a tree. We do standing meditation. Uh, we meditate in a doorway. We meditate by a river. We meditate by the water. We meditate in front of a waterfall. So, so there are let many me ways. Add this. Let me mm -hmm. add that what you're saying to interpret this is there are actions that you can take that are very, very still style, 
like meditation that will cultivate chi, and you can also do others that are action-oriented, like qigong, or like hugging a tree, or like even walking will cultivate chi. Right. That's what we call moving meditation. Right. So I teach four different types of walking meditation. I teach a dancing meditation. And I created a, a qigong dance for kids. And uh, that's what we're working on now. Yes. So, uh, yes. So, in fact, later on, maybe you'll we'll end the program with your singing one of those wonderful songs that you've developed <laughs> that <laughs> accompany the dance. I love it. No, you one flatter of the me. I love about you, George, and I really want the audience to get this, that traditional Chinese medicine has been with us really for um, probably, honestly, about 10,000 years. And, at least. Uh, at, least. There, at least. There are innovators along the way, and they're very interesting, and they've mainly been Chinese. But not only, there have been a few French, there have been a few German, there have been a few English, there have been a few Koreans, and a few Japanese along the way. No question about it. Well, now there are also a few Americans. And George Love is one of them who has brought a fresh, innovative mind to the subject of this ancient art and science and has been willing and courageous enough to think about how to improve this ancient art. And, George, I really tip my hat to you for that because uh, it's not something most of our classmates were willing to do. They were just willing to learn the points as they were taught, learn the meridians as they were taught, taught, learn the symptoms as they were taught, and almost rather mechanically, I was going to use the word robotically, go about the practice. And, indeed, they do help people. But when somebody brings the joy and enthusiasm and innovation and creativity that you do, well, I've got to tell you, I think that that intention behind that creation is powerfully healing itself. And I think that your clients would agree because they've got the results to show for it. What do you think of absolutely. that? Absolutely. That, that's absolutely true. My innovation is taking complex subjects and translating them for an American audience. Yeah. Most of the cultural reference points uh, for Chinese medicine are from nature and the Chinese observing nature. Well, exactly. we don't observe nature, so the nature reference no, doesn't really work for us. Nature. Right. <laughs> so, right. So, so when you talk about a flowing stream versus a river versus an ocean, we're like, what? So, um, so I, I use... Uh, an analogy. I use several car analogies and computer analogies. My yeah. favorite analogy is explaining how acupuncture really works. So let's say you're up in a traffic helicopter. You're looking down at a traffic jam. You have a laptop computer. You hit one button, all the red lights turn green. You hit another button, all the green lights turn red. So by hitting the various buttons on your laptop, you can change the flow of traffic. So let's say that you are US-1 or I-95, and your arms and legs are the entrance and exit ramps of uh -huh. that major highway. Yeah. So wherever there's a traffic jam, there's pain. Wherever there's weakness, there's not enough traffic. So my job as a healer and a doctor of Chinese medicine is to assess the traffic pattern, determine the flow, and then using points, alter the flow so that it's even flowing. And yeah. that is the mastery of qi gong. And exactly. then secondarily is to teach you the lifestyle healing method of breathing, meditation, exercise, self-massage, foods, and herbs so that you can learn to heal yourself. I don't want you to become dependent upon me the way Western medicine wants you to become dependent on them. Or, or even on any kind of particular substance like medication. That's just not the Chinese way. It's not the George Love way. It's not the Mitchell Rabin way. Become dependent on really healthy air and water. Mother Earth mm -hmm. herself with whom, not dependent, but we're interdependent because our exhalation becomes the oxygen, so to speak, for the trees and the plants all around us. That's a relationship That's of interdependence. Would you say? I said you're absolutely correct. Yeah, absolutely. And as far as the arms and the legs go as the exit 
ramps and <laughs> that major traffic um, image. We want to also remember the eliminative organs as well, George. That will help with the patency of the flow <laughs> that our uh, our elimination is working smoothly as well. Absolutely. Well, I, I further break this down into what I call the five phases of transformation. The first phase is what I call psychopuncture, and that is understanding your own cultural historical psychology, which I call your chips, your app, which is your attitude, your perspective, <laughs> and your perceptions, and then your OS, which is your operating system. So well, in order well. to understand your OS, you have to understand your chip, then you can reprogram your app and then reprogram your OS. So that's Wonderful. your psycho-emotional balance. Then we that's go into very, breathing. That's brilliant. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Then we go into yeah. phase two, which is breathing and meditation. And that's when we apply what we learned in phase one. Then in phase three, which I call raw love, is uh, food therapy and uh, juicing detox. And so the juicing detox is the way to correct your elimination experience. And then... E-E, yeah. It's it's definitely an experience. And then we go into food. Extreme exits, exactly. And then we go into food therapy. Now, food therapy is very simply hot and moist, hot and dry, cold and moist, cold and dry. And every human being on the planet fits into one of those four categories. Mm -hmm. And then we use foods and culinary herbs to balance that condition to move it into neutral territory. Not too hot, not too cold, not too damp, not too dry, just right. right. And and then, then phase four I call the essence of three treasures. And that is your Jing and your Jing tonics. Now, Jing is translated as essence. I translate it as hormones, Mm -hmm. particularly male hormones and female hormones. Now, what woman over 40 has balanced hormones in America? Yeah, like 0.1%. And what doesn't happen? Exactly. And what guy over 50? doesn't have diminished hormones, mm-hmm. unless he's been doing Qigong for 30 years, yeah. and drinking gin tonics, jing tonics the whole time. So guys and girls both need to learn about the essence of three treasures and how to maintain their jing by drinking jing tonics. And I created something called Dr. Love's Chocolate Magic. And what I've done is I'm, I'm using uh, South American chocolate as a delivery system for five medicinal mushrooms. As in dark chocolate? Yes. The the yeah. original chocolate was only yeah. dark. Okay? Mm-hmm. So uh, five medicinal mushrooms, uh, bee pollen, goji berry, and maca, cinnamon, ginger, and chili powder, and four ginsengs. So we have five mushrooms, four ginsengs, three spices, and three extra added ingredients. That's in the Sounds like a Christmas Dr. Love song and a partridge and a pear tree too. Oh uh, well, you, yeah. You, <laughs> when you get your front end lifted, there's your partridge. So, <laughs> so <laughs> and this tonic um, is going to do that. <laughs> absolutely, if you take it every day. So, yeah. um, so there's cool. there's your first four phases. And then the last phase uh, benefits the immune system, which is regulated by the liver. And then I've got a workbook. I have a 250-page workbook to carry you through the fifth phase. Mm. So it's uh, it's rather intense. It's a seven-month program to Uh transform your health for 2013. Now, this morning, Mitchell, I read that health insurance is going up 20% this year. Oh, my. 20%. Oh my. And this is so the what, year that Obamacare is supposed to kick in as well. 
So exactly. whatever was a stop, whatever was supposed to be the benefit of Obamacare has now in that sentence, George, been neutralized by the increase. Exactly. Just about. So yeah. my program, the five transformations, is the only way you're going to keep your head above water financially. Wow. Well, you know, that that's a big statement. And uh, I'm not necessarily going to accord with that one. But I would say that knowing you for as long as I have and as well as I have, that what you are offering is one dynamite, dynamite way that people could take incredible care, really intelligent care of their health through the detox and the, the building of chi and the hormones. That, mm-hmm. I think, is a fair thing to say. I want to let everyone know you are listening to Mitchell Rabin on A Better World Radio. We are on every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can get in touch with us through our website at www.abetterworld.tv if you're not yet on our newsletter, which goes out once a week. Go to that website and tune in. Please do. Become part of A Better World family. We are spending the hour with Dr. George Love, acupuncturist, qigong teacher, and healer at large in South Florida. It goes beyond South Florida. He also has been working with people in the Caribbean and sometimes uh, New York and different parts of the country because he has taken his work of healing and teaching qigong on the road and has wedded it in a most beautiful and artful way with music and dance. So it's really, as I was saying earlier, uh, really a masterful um, innovation uh, that George has done, has orchestrated quite literally with his knowledge of healing in general and Chinese medicine in particular. In fact, on that note, George, I want to just have it clear for the audience that most of what you're speaking about is with is foundationally based on the Chinese medicine principles and their energetics, but the whole idea of green juicing and eliminating through juicing is not, strictly speaking, part of that, and it's just, I think, another innovation of yours that you have brought. What works? That the real theme, the motif underneath the work that you and I do uh, is what works. We don't care if it's from the east, the west, the north, the south. We just want to get our hands on what helps people and empowers them and cleanses them and, as you were saying, increases the potential for longevity. So um, I, I so like let me, you... let me Let me clarify yeah. that because most yeah. Chinese practitioners do not get enough schooling in Chinese dietary therapy. Yeah. And if you do not understand Chinese dietary diagnostics, then you cannot apply Chinese dietary therapy. Expand okay? on that if you would. Yeah. Okay. So there, um, there's a book called uh, Vegetables as Medicine. This is yeah. a, then there's another book called Fruit as Medicine. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Bob Flaws who wrote sure. a book called Prince Wen Hui's Cook, and I went to we, Bob We Law's read him house. way back. We went, read him 30 years ago. Right. Well, I went to his house, and I stayed with his wife, Nora Lee Wolf, and she taught me Chinese cooking from oh, the oh. Chinese dietary therapy. Then yeah. I went to Shambhala uh, in Boulder, Colorado, and they Shambhala said, Press. you know, and they said, we have a bland diet. So not too hot, not too cold, not too moist, not too dry. We remain neutral, okay? Now, the principle of Chinese medicine is called balance. So we said before that people have sludge in their blood. Balance, George, not blandness. They're different. (laughs) Uh, I'm just telling you what they said, okay? Yeah. So the issue is if you have sludge in your blood, the only way to get it out is through a detoxification, all right? Yeah. Now, they use heavy minerals to detox. That causes diarrhea in Americans. Mm-hmm. So I had to find another substance that detoxified the blood. 
Now, I later found out that 25% of Chinese herbal medicines do not grow in China. They are imported from Africa and India and the Philippines. Oh, my. Which means that they have to have an understanding of how these herbs work in other countries in order to apply them to Chinese medicine. So it is Are you not saying traditionally, historically, that's the case? I'm saying historically, your, uh, your Materia Medica, 25% of that doesn't even grow in China. They come from oh, other countries. Hmm. Fascinating. It's, it's very fascinating. So, yeah. you'd, I mean, you'd really have to do some studying to find out because a lot of their stuff is called foreign, uh, foreign plant, mm-hmm. Bar- barbarian plant, foreign plant, barbarian plant. And you're like, well, why is it foreign? I thought it was Chinese. It doesn't grow yeah. in China. It's traded, but it doesn't grow in China. Mm. Okay? So and it, and it was to- incorporated into the Chinese pharmacopoeia. Exactly. So my point is that what you and I call Chinese medicine is actually the science of longevity. It's not Chinese. Now, how do I know it's not Chinese? Well, there is a book called, um, I forgot the guy's name. He's Persian. He wrote a medical textbook in the 10th century. So I was helping my wife, Anahita, translate uh, this book. The first two volumes of the book was completely Chinese medicine that this guy claims is Persian medicine. Oh. So I'm like 10th and century. what were you translating it from, Farsi into English? She was translating it from ancient Farsi into modern Farsi. Oh, my. And then... Yeah. I was helping her translate it from modern Farsi into English because she didn't have the herbal background. So by the way they were describing hot and cold and moist and dry, I was able to decipher where they were going with this. You know, I've got to just say, what you're suggesting isn't to me really far-fetched. I'm a little. I'm surprised on first blush, so to speak, but um, it is my belief, um, and there is evidence that a lot of the origins of Chinese medicine really is Ayurvedic, and it stands to reason that because the Persian culture predates the Vedic culture, that a lot of Vedic culture came from two places. You're you're now suggesting Persian, but it's also from Ukrainian culture, and there's a very a f- bit of interesting evidence, even from one of our classmates, George Ores Pelachati, educated me about this some years back when we met uh, years after our classes, um, saying that a lot of Vedic culture got formed from the removal of Ukrainian spiritual sacred texts to India, to the Himalayas. Okay, well, I I don't have enough information to dispute that or confirm that, but I do know that in the 6th century, Tibetans held medical contests and invited everybody in the known world to come to Tibet to present cases and offer remedies for specific uh, uh, illnesses. And they did that the 6th century, 7th century, 8th century, and 9th century. And then they codified over 400 years all of the known medicine into what we now call Tibetan medicine. Mm. Now, it is entirely possible that this Persian guy was able to access that information and include it in his medical textbook a hundred years later. Yes. Okay? Now, as we all know, Persia was the crossroads of the East. China Mm -hmm. and India both had business dealings with Persia. They had embassies. 
So it is entirely possible that there was a mixture of their medical philosophy and knowledge of plants yeah. between the 6th and the 10th century. So what you and I call Chinese medicine could very well be a syncretism of all the known medicine at the time. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Because we do know that the Tibetans, what they did, and we know uh, Ibn Sina, Avicenna, wrote the canon of medicine in the mm-hmm. 10th century. Now, he was only 36 years old when he wrote it. Now, he was called a genius in his own time, but at 36 to write a 10-volume encyclopedia of healing, he had to be copying from somewhere. Yes. Okay? So my position is what we call Chinese medicine is actually the science of longevity. It just happened to be saved in China. Now, when the Chinese invaded Tibet and they took everything out of the Patala, we thought that Chinese medicine was lost in its original form. A hundred, a hundred years later, 20, uh, 30 years later, in Buryatia, Russia, they were moving a cabinet and they found an original text of Tibetan medicine encyclopedia that was gifted. Now, Buryatia is in Russia. I don't know where it is. It could be the Ukraine for all I know. But I do Uh know that the Chinese had a habit every year of sending medical ambassadors throughout the world with their textbook and their medicinal plant seeds. So I believe that the Tibetans are single-handedly responsible for transporting what you and I call Chinese medicine all over the world. That's very interesting. There's a, there's another uh, limb to this tree that we really should speak about, which might be a touch more um, indigenously Chinese, and that is the uh, influence of Taoism, Lao Tzu, and the other major Taoist thinkers and practitioners on Chinese medicine. I'm we, glad you, you brought that up. That? Yeah. Now, have you read the book by Ko Hung? No. Ko Hung was a 3rd century uh, Taoist uh, hermit. And he, as far as, as far as I'm concerned, created the scientific principle of experimenting on oneself before mm-hmm. uh, moving forward and saying such and such works. Oh, so, this so was a, you, you could say this is the da- Taoist hygiene. This Exactly. Yeah. So, so Taoists in particular tested all the medicinal plants in their area. So uh, I would venture to say that you're absolutely correct that Taoism is particularly Chinese. However, if we go back far enough, we find out that Taoism actually originated in Egypt and was transported into China. But the expression of it in China is obviously Chinese. So and just imagine when we think about uh, the the poetry of Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, and that that seems so inherently indigenous. But you know, you're bringing up a whole very interesting arc of history here by mentioning Egypt, because George, uh, we have reason to believe that the Egyptian civilization is a latter-day expression of Atlantean. And you could say, well, where is the archaeological evidence? But there is uh, evidence um, that needs to be interpreted, yes. But you know what? So does an archaeological artifact have to be interpreted. So what we see is that what we call or think of as a pure civilization or a culture is actually a cross-fertilization of probably numerous cultures, both laterally, meaning at the time, as well as chronologically having to do with history. Okay, well, I only speak about things that I'm certain of, and I do know that the medicine that I teach, the Qigong, is 10,000 years old, which would be consistent with ancient Egypt, ancient China, ancient India, 
and yeah. ancient anything else that existed back then Perfect. because shamans and wise men traveled back and forth and traded information. Okay? So Well we have we have records of shaman, Siberian shamans going back thirty thousand years. Exactly. So yeah. please go on. If if the knowledge is the knowledge, it does it matter which culture fostered, produced because as as a martial artist in the martial arts world, we say you can't say that martial arts is Chinese anymore because it's all over the world. And yeah. by the same token, if martial arts belongs to the world, Chinese medicine also belongs to the world. So yeah. we have to Beautiful. start calling it what it is, the science of longevity, and get away with, from this Chinese perspective. They were the ones who cared for it until it could be rediscovered. But yes, that's a very did not nice way of putting it. Necessarily, yeah. Originate. They were caretakers. They were caretakers. They were the caretakers. Absolutely. So yeah. we acknowledge them for the caretaking, but it has to continue to grow and be innovative. And in our culture, in the in the Western culture, we have different reference points. We have to use computers and cell phones as reference points to understand the nature of the flow of energy. And that's the job that I've chosen for myself. And if I can teach you how to breathe and I can teach you how to move and I can teach you how to use two ounces of leverage to move 200 pounds, I think mm -hmm. I've done my job. Now, that sounds Greek to me, but um, I want to circle back, George, love, to the role of um, self-care in all that you're speaking of. Let's give... Uh, as we're beginning to head out of uh, toward the end of the show, I really want to mm -hmm. have our audience empowered by your many years of study, practice, and wisdom to be able to walk away with um, some tools that they can utilize on a daily basis to cleanse themselves and move forward in their bodies and their longevity. Okay. Number one, go outside into the grass, barefoot, and stomp your feet for 10 minutes every morning. Even Number if you two, live in New York? Especially if you winter, live in New York. And it's the winter? <laughs> in Japan, they go outside, rain, snow, sleet, or hail, and they stamp their bare feet into the ground. That's uh -huh. the only way to connect with... I mean, you know how many acupuncture points are on the bottom of a foot. You know that the kidney chi is the root to the oh, earth. Yeah. And you know one, that baby. stamp. Right. So you, so you know that uh, bladder 67 and uh, stomach 45, and liver Gold 1, spleen 1, liver, gallbladder 46. So you have to stamp your feet in the earth to access that energetic connection. Yes. Then you have to swing your arms up to the sky to open your heart. So swinging your arms moves the shoulders, which then moves the lungs, which then moves the heart. So swinging your arms, stamping your feet, drinking 40 ounces of water, and then doing 15 minutes of sitting meditation twice a day. Now you can get away with 10 minutes. If you do 10 minutes twice a day of sitting meditation, you're going to be better off than 98% of the population. Mm. Okay? So those are okay. some practical things you can do to start cultivating your chi. And what, do you say to thing, people, what do you say to people, just a side note here, when they say, oh, my mind doesn't stop thinking, I cannot concentrate on my breath because my thoughts keep pulling me away. What do you say to them? You count your breaths. Count, count to seven as you breathe out. Deep breath in. Count to seven as you breathe out. Deep breath in. So six of those equals one minute. Sixty will equal ten minutes. So if you count your breaths while you're breathing out and then deep breath in, you really don't have time to think. You just have to count your <laughs> breath. Great. Please go okay? on. Yeah. Now, if you're really so smart, your you're going to go on YouTube. 15 minutes of breathe of, of following your breath meditation, 40 mm -hmm. ounces of water in the morning, mm -hmm. 
cleansing right. the liver and the kidneys that have been doing their detoxification job all night and need the water to carry out the toxins out of the body. Yeah, go on. Right. Okay. Now, if you go on YouTube and you type in Dr. Love Raps, my video will come up. You'll watch the video, and then I have 150 videos on YouTube from every kind of subject you can think of, Qigong, philosophy, meditation, exercise, juicing, herbs, raw foods. So that will open you up into a whole world of Hmm. the science of longevity. Yes. That's wonderful. And talk about the hormones. You know, the word hormone... Uh, something I looked into many years ago, and I hope this is correct, comes from the ancient Greek harmain, H-A-R-M-E-I-N, which is the basis of the word harmony. So when the hormones are balanced, your body is in harmony. And mm-hmm. it's making the right music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that. So what else uh, can our audience do? To uh, you can give out my phone number and my website. <clears throat> yes, please do it. Please do it. Uh, area code 561-502-6200. Area code 561-502-6200. And the website is www.bocaraton, one word, dash acupuncture.com. Excellent. One more time. www.bocaraton, that's one word, dash acupuncture.com. And for those of you who don't know, acupuncture only has one C. (laughs) And one P. And one P. And Boca Raton, if if you live in New York, you know how to spell Boca Raton. Uh, if you got if you got uh, <laughs> listeners in Austria or Sweden or something like that, it's B O C A R A T O N. That's great. <laughs> now, there's a very important ingredient in all of this, George, that you uh-huh. have not touched upon, but is interestingly inherent to your whole practice, and. Uh-huh. We know the role of the Tao. We know the role of food. We know the role of breath and the cultivation of chi. But we haven't talked today yet about the role of love, Dr. Love. Would you say a word in closing about the role of love? (laughs) Okay. So we all think that the heart is a muscle that pumps the blood. Well, we're wrong. The blood pumps the heart, and the chi moves the blood. You've been lied to. You've been bamboozled. You've been misled by the medical establishment, okay? So, for argument purposes, if you hear, your blood pressure goes up. Your heart speeds up. And if you hear some really sad violin music, your blood pressure drops and your heart slows down. So the music made your heart speed up and slow down. So what made the heart do that? Was it the blood or was it the sound from the ears? You know, what made the heart speed up and slow down? It had to be the blood, not the reverse. Now, why is that important? Because your emotional feeling opens your heart, lowers your blood pressure, or closes your heart, and stimulate your blood pressure. So it's your emotions. It's how you feel. Now, love is the only expression of God. God is not angry. God is not vengeful. God is not punishing. God is only love. So when you are loving, your heart is open to God. And open to your lover, open to your spouse, your mother, your father, your kids, your brother, your sister, your coworkers, your neighbors. And when your heart is open, you look beautiful. And everyone will tell you that when your heart is open. They can say, oh, you look wonderful. What would you do? What you take right. it? Oh, my heart yeah. is open. Oh, my. 
So I get that all day long. Can you teach me how to open my heart? Yeah. And, of course, I do. But um, you're going to have to come to Florida for that. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So then there is the the feeling of love, and there's also the experience of love. And a lot of that is an attitude and an intention. It's mm-hmm. a it's a perspective on embracing life, and mm-hmm. at the end of the day, that is a major role in helping the patency of chi flow and of immune function operation. That's what I was saying right before you came on the show, George, and uh, I wanted to really emphasize that people feeling good their well-being uh-huh. and their love of self and their love of other, the respect of self and respect of other, actually figures in prominently in their health, physical health and well-being. Mm-hmm. So we're on it, George. We're on it. You're doing We're beautiful. on it. And, and I Mitchell, I want to commend you, you for holding space, for creating the TV show and the concept of better world and the television interviews and I really appreciate you as a man standing in his power in 2013 in New York City which is a tough place to make a stand huh, and, well, and I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart God bless you thank you so much you're a dear friend and brother and colleague and we're on the same path here to utterly educate and transform the world people by people, and uh, have a ball at doing so, and really help to uh, increase the vibration of the whole planet. So Mm -hmm. thank you again, George, for being a guest, and thank you for your kind words and for your your completely committed work that you've been up to for so long. Okay. Thank you, brother, and I will speak with you very soon. Thanks for joining us. Very soon. All right. Okay. Peace and blessings to the audience as well. God bless. Great. God bless. That was Dr. George Love, and I would certainly encourage you to get in touch with him as he invited you to, and go to his YouTube channel as well as uh, to his website. He's been uh, a real friend and teacher for me as well over the course of decades at this point. And uh, after all this time, it's just such a pleasure and honor to be able to uh, have him on the show and share his uh, his cultivation with us all. So this is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World. Thank you so much for joining us again today at the beginning of the new year, kicking off 2013. Yes, we have successfully gone through the end and now the beginning of the Mayan calendar, as well as our own Roman calendar. It has just come to an end, and we are beginning yet again in 2013, which if we can find the fount of our own love, our own center, and stay with our own integrity, the world will begin to work. We also need to stay and remember that we are the center of our own power, and we are influencing all the time. So let's influence with kindness, love, a little play, and lots of humor. Thanks again. This is Mitchell J. Rabin. Visit us at our website, www.abetterworld.tv, abetterworld.tv. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. And tune in now for some closing sounds from Mozart. Bye-bye now. Wolfgang, where are you?